happen to love that piece because I used to be a curatorial assistant at MoMA and I used to have to be the one to report the dust bunnies on the ledge, so I've spent a lot of time looking at those dust bunnies too. Um, I wanted to start this conversation, Nina, by ask, asking you a little bit about the productivity of, uh, of, can you all hear me first of all? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. I wanted to ask you about the productivity of pressure because I feel that um, one of the things that I love about your work is the way you work within, you seem to be constantly imposing constraints and you know, self-imposed constraints on your practice and it seems to be incredibly productive in the way you work and I mean I think we can talk a little bit about seat assignment perhaps sure. with this but I just wanted to ask you a little bit about, about that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of projects, I think, that have rules, self-designed self rules, yeah. um, and that the rules kind of, I make them up for myself and then they help me kind of generate the work. So sorted books might be another one. Um, but yeah, I'm, I guess I'm someone who likes, I, I, I like to work sometimes much preferably with less than more, um, which I think, I think there's sort of always this question of like, how, how much can you do with how little? And um, there are even categories within seat assignment specifically where I think I'm, I'm trying to ask that even within a project that is already a lot about having limited time, limited materials, limited space, limited privacy, all those kinds of things. Um, so it's, I like deadlines. I've always liked assignments. Um, you know, there, there's something just very useful about pressure around that and I think for better or worse and we have this a little bit in common which is maybe why it's a miracle that we have this done on time <laughs> or even early um, that there's something about when time is ticking down that you, you sometimes really really get into motion there is no time to mess around you make decisions you have to be clear you have to kind of go with a little bit more of a gut instinct sometimes and sometimes that's actually good and it, it seems sometimes like you're able to go deeper in part because you've given yourself a set of constraints. So there's, the, you just keep mining that material. I mean, when you started doing seat assignment and making work on airplanes, I don't think you ever imagined that seven years later, you'd, you know, 250 flights later, you'd still yeah. be making work. And I, I was really struck. Can you um, talk a little bit about the, um, the how you made the lavatory self-portraits? Because I was really struck by the way pressure operated sure. there. Um, so the backstory here is that I, I had been making seat assignment um, for about a year when I got an invitation from um, a museum in New Zealand to come and do a residency there and the residency kind of cult would culminate in an exhibition. So I'd have six weeks there and then I would have this show. And I said to them, well, I'm about a year into this project called seat assignment um, where I make work on planes using only what I find and I, I only use my cell phone to document my efforts with. Would you be willing to let me try something which is that I will make the entire show on the way to New Zealand? You know, like, could you get comfortable with that? Um, <laughs> And they said, okay, which was brave of them, and, and suddenly really turned the screws on me, because this flight, I had 20 hours of flight time, but, you know, it's kind of a long time to also, like, not sleep a lot and, you know, try to keep being productive and interesting. And, and I was curious if I would still, in fact, feel that the world was, like, such an interesting place with jet lag 20 hours in, right? So, um, so one thing that had happened, and it sort of seemed like this flight to New Zealand was an opportunity, um, was that on a domestic flight, um, a cross-country flight, I ended up going into the bathroom and spontaneously having this idea, like I've never made a costume, like maybe I could dress up in here. So I took one of those <laughs> tissue paper seat covers and I kind of fashioned it into a hat or a headdress and, and um, took a picture. I, I always take the pictures, not in the mirror, but you know, with the camera sort of lens facing me and I, I took it, went back to my seat and looked at it and thought, that's really strange. I, I remind myself of a Flemish painting, and like, why did I just do that? It, it didn't, it wasn't clear to me wh why that had even sort of happened. But I did sort of feel I need to make a few more of these now. And this flight to New Zealand, because I was sort of banking on the fact that 14 hours, unbroken, people would be asleep, people wouldn't be using the bathroom, there would never be a line, you know, I could just have an aisle seat and kind of go in there a lot, which is what happened. And, and I worked and worked and worked furiously. I, I did a lot of things besides those portraits on that flight. I made a music video, I made a lot of other things in my seat, <laughs> too, but that was the sort of one flight where all but one of those portraits in that gallery got made. Um, and I got kind of brazen. I mean, the first, the first trip to the bathroom was like, ah, you know, rush, rush, rush. And then I kind of got back to my seat like panting and realized that was maybe faster than it needed to be. And the next time I was like, maybe I'll take seven minutes and then 10 minutes and then 15 minutes. And it was like, no one cares. I can be in here for 20 minutes and no one cares. <laughs> so relaxed, I was very relaxed by the end. Well, and I love the music videos. If you haven't had a chance to um, watch the music videos, the one that 
that you most recently did is Under Pressure, which I feel like could be the anthem to your life almost, um, <laughs> yeah. in addition to many other things. But uh, I also, I think people are confused about how you made them, like how much preparation there was, how you actually constructed them, because you're essentially playing David Bowie and Freddie Mercury, and you're, and, and, and how were you orchestrating all of that? Yeah, so, um, so <laughs> the, the first of them, um, was done, uh, yeah, well, I'll just talk about Under Pressure. It's, the, the methodology is basically that I try to learn the song really well, I try to kind of get it into my head, I transcribe the lyrics, I, I sometimes tape the lyrics up in front of me in the bathroom so I kind of know who's gonna sing what part. The Bee Gees one, the triptych in the show is the most complicated because the background vocals are really complicated and I had to remember when I was Barry, when I was Robin, and when I was Morris and like not get them mixed up. <laughs> um, so. I would sort of, I, with the Bee Gees one, there are, there are three screens, I did them one, two, three takes in a row, and that was it. There weren't multiple takes of them, but I had to be like, now I'm Barry, okay, I'm only doing lead vocals now. And then I, um, it's important to me to not um, over-rehearse these two. So that's a little bit part of the, the self-imposed rule as well, is that I don't want the performance to be sort of perfectly flawless. Like in all three of them, there's a moment where I forget a lyric or two, or I kind of screw it up a little bit, and I think, I guess that's important because the circumstances of the making are so odd <laughs> to yeah. be in a bathroom trying to do this. And I think there's something about it um, feeling, it makes it feel spontaneous. It makes it feel like it's happening in the moment. So I also love there's a moment where one of the Bee Gees characters, um, I feel like the, I can't remember which brother it is, but you always look stressed out in that one. And it's sort of like, it reminds <laughs> yeah. me of being on an airplane. There's some anxiety in the performance, <laughs> yes. you know, um, yes. which I love. Cause that, there's one that looks like a crusader, one looks like a rock star, and then one that looks stressed the out all the time. Like just so worried. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But I, I also wanted to just say that, you know, part of the job of curator, I, I knew that I really wanted to write about this body of work for the, for the catalog essay. It was when I did a studio visit with Nina. She had just begun the project. It was before Lavatory Self-Portraits. And I knew that it was, I, to me, it's it's a brilliant project for so many reasons, and I won't get into all of them, but, um, but I was, uh, you know, the life of a curator is hectic and busy, and I don't write well at my desk or in, in the office. And I was having dinner with my friend Lisa one night, and I was saying, oh my gosh, I have so much work travel coming up soon. I don't know how I'm going to get this done. And she's like, Veronica, the, the answer is kind of obvious. You're going to write it on the, on the airplane. airplane. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, yes. I was like, this is genius. And so the I wrote the entire essay between takeoffs and landings. I allowed myself to edit once I was obviously back in the office, but I have to say it was an incredible experience, not only because I was writing about things that were made on an airplane, so there's something beautiful about being on the airplane, but it took all the, pr it actually, I, it meant that I was very productive when I was on the plane, but it meant that as soon as I, I realized how much psychological weight you have worrying about the things you need to be doing, yeah. but if you can't possibly be writing when you're back at the office, then you don't feel any guilt yeah, about it. Great. And it was, it was really a wonderful lens into your process too. Um, we have yet to fly together, by the way. I know. <laughs> Strange. Will, we need to we work on that. We must find a reason. We to always travel. are flying to the same places though. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the importance of curiosity because I think that it is, it is. I'm really taking away from the the show. Um, I mean, I think we saw with your images of growing up in Finland, and I now think that Finland was so integral to who you are. I, I really I see that. But part of what seems integral is the fact that your curiosity was really sparked by your family but you never let go of it. And I feel like so often childhood, we are told at some point to stop drawing, you know, between, to draw only between the lines. And, um, and we lose sight of that play. And you've talked a little bit about rigorous play um, and curiosity. And I, I just, I, I would love for you to talk a, li a little bit more about that. And also explain the title, because it's more than what people think. Sure. Um, yeah, well, the title was a suggestion by, by my friend Joel Smith. And, you know, we'd been tossing around the idea of calling the show Curiouser and Curiouser, and he said, I think just Curiouser is, a, and we both really liked that as a, as a word. It's kind of a little awkward, which I'm fond of awkward, if you haven't noticed by now. And, um, <laughs> and I think it also sounds like a job description. So I like the idea of someone saying, what do you do? And you'd say, I'm a Curiouser, I'm a curator, I'm a, you know, it's like a- Lawyer, doctor, they lawyer, all end in ER, Baker, OR. Curiouser. So, um, I will say, I, I think one thing the show has made me think a lot about is that I think curiosity requires um, more time and space than we give it, give it room for often. I think that, um, you know, the thing with play is that it, 
two things about play. Y you have to kind of allow it to play out. Like you need to have the, s the, the space and time for the thing to kind of find its own, whatever the activity is, to kind of find its own course. And um, that's important, and I think we kind of tr tend to truncate things often before before the right, you know, before there is a chance for something to go somewhere. I, I also think that um, play is not much without rigor attached to it. And this is a, we talked a lot about this, and I get asked a lot about this play question. Um, and I always say it's not just about kind of messing around. Um, it's also about taking that process really seriously and seeing it through, not talking yourself out of certain impulses, but really kind of deciding that whatever it is that's making me want to do this, could lead me somewhere. It might be, I might be, like, without really knowing why, like, kind of onto something. And I just have to yeah. keep doing it until I, I sort of know more. Um, so sometimes you do it to figure out why you're doing it. Um, and I think, I think that, yeah, the rigor part is important. You have to do it with a certain commitment. <laughs> for it to move somewhere else. And I think people have really been struck by that in the show and they feel inspired themselves to stick with things. There's sort of a stick to itness that you have in your work. Um, I just wanted to, on the same lines, there's a, a, a wonderful Solowit quote that I think sums up also your what you just said. Um, illogical judgments lead to new experience and irrational thoughts should be followed absolutely and logically, which I think is really, that's like, you, you <laughs> guys really are a good. team there. Because uh, one of the things I was struck by in the show, and you and I were talking about this when we put it together, is how many ongoing bodies of work you have, which made installation kind of challenging for you because you kept having to, you know, uh, there were a lot of projects you added to for Austin, yeah. but I mean, sorted books you've been doing for 25 years. I mean, you really don't have commitment issues here, Nina. Like, you are <laughs> like full on <laughs> commitment. I mean, Sorted yeah. Books, 25 years. Seed Assignment's been seven years. Genealogy, I can't remember how many years, mm. but I think that's been almost 20. Um, but it's funny because there are those projects where I'm always adding to them. And then there are also things where I did something for a really long time without knowing what the hell it was. Yeah. Like paranormal yeah. postcards. Like, I mean, it took 25 years to make the recarcassing ceremony because I've mm. wanted to make that piece for so long and just could not figure out how. And um, that's an example, actually, of an instance where <laughs> Denise Marconish from Mass Mocha, who curated a show last year about wonder, um, two years ago, this show, I guess the invitation came my way, and it was suddenly like, if I tell Denise I'm going to make this piece for the show, I have to make this piece for the show. So deadline, pressure, get it done, ha make it happen. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, it did. But... Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's a 20 minute long film. I won't say much because it it's needs to be watched, but um, it's been wonderful to see people go in and not leave. They, they stay the whole time. And, um, and part of putting together the exhibition was, was really a wonderful back and forth between us. And I remember you were saying, as you were working on this, on this Mass Mocha video, you were saying, you know, I really feel like something feels important about it, but you hadn't even finished it. And we decided to put it in the exhibition. And I, I feel like that was one of the best decisions we made. <laughs> this is this is an exemplary curator who trusts the artist to do this because not everybody would be so. I mean, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Well, we appreciate <laughs> it because we get the film, and <laughs> it's um, it really brings things together in a in a wonderful way, and I think speaks to. So I will stop speaking about it because you all just need to watch it. But <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask ask you a little bit about misunderstandings because it seems like you, in your interest in language and your interest in translation, you've also talked a lot about the productivity of misunderstandings, um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the role that plays in your yeah. work. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I often like to make the point that I think when you're really confused about something and trying to kind of find your way back to sense, you do a certain kind of very reckless but very creative thinking. Um, maybe a good way to exemplify this <laughs> point is to talk about a piece of mine called Natural Car Alarms from a long time ago now. Um, but I had been on a residency in Trinidad. I had been on a hike to a very remote part of the island and had stopped in the middle of really like the rainforest where there were no roads and no people living and had heard a sound that I had identified for myself as a car alarm, which was a crazy thing to think because there was nothing like that anywhere near me. It was like my New York soundscape kind of creeping in and, in, and kind of infecting the place that I was. And, um, and I really liked the error. It was a really, I thought, interesting mistake and it said something about what we would sort of normally want to delineate as natural sounds and unnatural sounds and this idea that somehow they're, they're, they're these categories. Um, so when I got back to New York, I made a piece where I deliberately redesigned the standard six-tone car alarm to use only bird sounds. And so there were these cars that would scream these alarms, but they were these bird calls that sounded a lot like alarms. And I hoped by doing so that the same kind of 
interesting, productive, if you want to say confusion, would be there for, for somewhere, someone encountering it. So I guess what happened is I'm standing there in the rainforest, I hear the sound, and suddenly that sound could be so many different things. And so maybe these moments of confusion for me are also about the sort of possibility inherent in something that is usually very fixed. It's like something suddenly opens up and it could be anything for like a little amount of time and then things kind of like go back to making sense and kind of close down a little, which I think as it says in the catalog when we talk about this, like I'm always a little disappointed when that happens. Right. <laughs> things make sense again. So Well, and I think um, maybe this is also my own bias and, and interest since we share a love of birds, but it, you've the natural world has definitely been really important in your practice and we can see some of where that came from. Mm -hmm. But um, I also think we, Nina installed, we have a wonderful sound piece outside, which was probably drowned out a little bit by the block party today. Um, please, please, pleased to meet you, and um, which has to do with bird song and bird calls. But it was wonderful because when we installed it in the trees, Austin, if any of you live here, you're very familiar with the grackles. And they are the last, so Nina was just like completely floored when she visited Austin for those times. She's like, this is amazing. These birds are insane. And it's, it's really part of the like live music scene here in Austin. Um, <laughs> And we put the we put these you know recordings into the trees, and the grackles were going crazy. And one of them was of a grackle, so it was just like, am I listening to a real grackle or is it Nina's <laughs> grackle? You should probably explain that piece a little yeah. bit. But um, it's it's really nice on this site here. It's so confusing it's so in perfect. a good way. Um, yeah. The piece was made by working with a number of translators at the UN, and I sort of brought them to my studio and asked them to look at. Um, dis written descriptions of bird song, which are this very weird category of, of thing. Like, you know, how do you describe the way a bird sounds? It's, it's a strange kind of translation challenge. Do you yeah, do it yeah. phonetically? Do you do it according to mnemonics? The title of the piece, Please, Please, Please to Meet Ya, is actually the mnemonic for the chestnut-sided warbler's call. So people have these sort of tricks for remembering, you know, oh, sweet, Canada, 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 white-throated sparrow, like these things. <laughs> and, um, and so these, these translators who are not allowed to hear the bird, the real call, had to kind of deal with these texts and then try to vocalize from those. So that's what you're hearing in the trees are all these UN translators. And the thing, of course, I was also really happy about is that many of them spoke with accents because they come from other places, speak many languages, and so a lot of that kind of crept into their vocalizations as well. Um, yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Well, I, I want to just ask one more question and then we'll open it up to Q&A. But I did want to talk a little bit about music, too, um, because I think sound and music, you've done some amazing sound installations. There's one with um, the Apollo moon landing. Uh, but you also, if any of you haven't had a chance to hear Nina's own voice, um, you should listen to Sky Mall Kitties, which is really one of the greatest um, videos. And I, I sing it in the shower pretty much every week. Um, Sky Mall, it's My so minor good. YouTube viral yeah, hit. Your YouTube, but, um, but talk a little bit about your interest in, in music and sound. Maybe you, you could talk a tiny bit about the Marfa sure. Jingles, because sure. I think that project's really quite yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I was actually sort of, as a kid, I was much more engaged in making music than I was making art, and it sort of was maybe like the more important creative pursuit for a long time mm -hmm. before I discovered making art. And um, I, 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 yeah, I love sonic things. There's a lot of sound in this show, I yeah. think, in different ways. Sometimes hitched to sculptural situations, like talking popcorn, but um, I teach a sound art class at NYU. I, I love talking about sound with people. And there's something also about putting a sound work in a, in a, this happens more and more these days, but in a sort of visual arts environment where people are a little bit like disarmed. They're not using, yeah. using the senses that they maybe came expecting to use. Right. Um, so, it's a fascinating medium. It requires very different kinds of decisions, too, than when you're working with something that's primarily visual. So, yeah, and music, you know, it's, um, it's a very collaborative thing. And you make music with people. It's a, it's a fascinating kind of communication. And um, the project that Veronica referred to was a, a project I got to do in Marfa in 2008 um, with Regine Basha, who's somewhere here, one of the curators of this show. Um, Rebecca Gates might be here, too. And Lucy Raven was the third curator. Um, and they invited um, a number of artists to come to Marfa and kind of make something that would be, in most cases, kind of cited there. And um, I just didn't know anything about Marfa. I'd never been there. And I felt I wanted a project that would help me get to know the place and work with some people there. And mm -hmm. so I made the album um, there with musicians there. And it's called the Marfa Jingles. And the idea was that I put out a call to kind of the town. Anyone who wanted a jingle to advertise their business or their club or anything at all could sort of tell me, tell me what they wanted the song to sound like, tell me what content they wanted the song to cover. I'd write a song for them and it would be played on the local radio station for a couple months. So everyone from the, the public library to the Food Rotary shark. Club to the food truck to yeah. 
um, yeah, the local kind of uh, outdoor guide, th these kinds of places. So um, it was it was a ton of fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, well, speaking of fun, I'm going to let you all have a little as well. So um, I I can't really see because I'm a little bit blinded. So I'll, I'll um, but if you have any questions uh, for Nina, raise your hand vigorously. Um, I see one in the way back, all the way up there. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, given your interest in words and language and limits and rules and sound and meaning, are you a poetry person? Oh. Do you respond to poetry? Wow. Have you, you know, do you work with poetry? That's a really interesting question. Are you question. a poetry person? If I, don't, didn't hear I don't write poetry, although I have to say writing song lyrics sometimes has some of the same challenges, sort of. Um, my mother translates poetry, so I've been around a lot of people who work with poetry. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, it's, I have to admit, it's one of these sort of literary genres in which I'm terribly ill-read, actually. I, I, it's, it's, I haven't read nearly enough poetry. I don't know nearly enough about poetry. So um, I'm a, an appreciator, but a naive, I would say. Um, sorted books as a, as, a, as a project, as an exercise, and this is something that one, <laughs> one of my favorite things also that, that you guys here at the Blenton have come up with for the show is this last room where people can try making sorted books themselves using these books that have been gathered br brilliantly chosen from used bookstores here and there. Um, but there is a sort of poetic you know, writing exercise type quality to that activity where you have to think very efficiently about the language you're going to use. And again, you're kind of constrained by what's already on the books. Yeah. Um, but I encourage all of you to try it here and then try it at home with your own books and then send me anything that you think turned out good because I love seeing people's results and their own, amazing. Yeah, their own take on this project. Yeah. All right, I see one. Um, woman. This is sort of a random question, but the photograph of the book that you said you're obsessed with, the caption said that the sea was calm with turtles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can tell you a lot about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for that. I could talk about Survive the Seven Sea for an hour. Um, <laughs> The Robertson family survived largely by catching fish, and at a certain point they figured out how to catch sea turtles. And using this crazy, lucky they had it, kitchen knife that kind of like floated around in the water after their sailboat sank that they retrieved, they were able to catch the turtles, lift them aboard, and stab them, drink the blood, which was a source of great nourishment, and water and liquids, you know, they, they weren't really very lucky with the rain sometimes. And then they what they would do is, you know, take the turtle meat out, dry it, hang it in, they would dry it in strips on these sort of like ropes of the dinghy, and, um, and save the oil <laughs> in a little kind of glass bottle, and I don't remember how they had the glass bottle. And the sea, um, oil is heavy, and it's heavier than water, so the sea had these sort of choppy waves when they pulled up to the fishing boat, and they decided to just dump all the turtle oil they had on it to kind of flatten that part of the sea. Um, I'll tack on one more Survive the Savage Sea story here by saying that um, <laughs> the fiberglass dinghy that they wound up in, which, by the way, with six people in it, um, had six inches of freeboard, meaning that's like it was only like this much that they were above the waterline in the Pacific Ocean. Wow for like 18 days, um, just in that boat. And um, that, that dinghy survived this whole ordeal too because the, the, the fishermen were about to toss the boat over the side and all the stinky stuff that was in there with it. And the family were like, no, 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 please. We need to keep her, you know, like she saved our lives. So they brought the dinghy back on deck and the dinghy has wound up in a museum, a maritime museum in Cornwall, England, where I made a pilgrimage, <laughs> like, maybe seven years ago now, six years ago now. Um, I wrote to the curator trying to sound kind of official. I'm an artist based in New York. I am interested in the Robertson family's thing. Like, I, I think one day I'm gonna have to make a project about Survive yeah. the Savage Sea, but I don't know what it is yet. But I made it sound like I did. And, and this person said, we'd be happy to show you the Edna Mare dinghy and so I went to this I went to this museum they had gotten her out of storage for me walked into this warehouse where she was sitting there and it was like 
laying hands on a holy object, seriously. It was <laughs> unbelievable to see how small this boat was. And after I had had my moment with that, and the curator, I think at this point, was thinking, she's a little bit obsessed with this, slightly <laughs> strange. He took me upstairs where there was a whole box of artifacts that they had saved from the boat. And they included the bottle of turtle oil. And so, you know, there was the turtle oil and this, they, uh, they also had a crazy way of making, <laughs> forgive me for the coarseness here, but these turtle oil enemas, which were really important because it helped them absorb seawater without getting sick. You can't drink seawater, but it turns out you can like, with the turtle oil help, you can have a seawater enema and you absorb water from that. So, in case you're ever in a situation like that, <laughs> thank me now for having told you. <laughs> um, and so the curator is taking these objects out of the box and, and he's like, and here was, you know, the, the, the turtle oil that they used, and I would be completing a sentence for him, yes, with those turtle oil enemas and the, on the 14th day when they took the turtle oil in order to cover their sea boils and he was sort of shaking his head and I said, does anyone ever come here to see this stuff? And he said, you know, yeah. not so much. <laughs> so. <laughs> There, okay, someone in the front. Yes, sorry, up there, yes. Um, can you talk about, you know, one of the defining features of your practice seems to be that you work serially, you know, and, and it would be a really different experience if there was one object that encapsulated each project. Um. So I, I wondered if you could talk about mm. that. That's where, interesting. Where do you think that comes from, or what, what that does for you, or yeah. have you ever thought about? Is it just something you've always seen? <laughs> I guess that is often true. Um, and you've also worked a lot with cereal, the other kind. <laughs> that's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's what she's asking about. You couldn't resist I that. couldn't. <laughs> um, hmm. I haven't thought much about this, but you know, I think there's a bit of a quality when you do something, when I do something, where I sort of want to be like, well, then what happens if you do that? And then what happens if you do that? And then what happens if you do that? So maybe with a project like Sorted Books, mm -hmm. It changes every time you're in a new book collection. It changes every time you're on a new site. And the results are not the same. So it's like it is an ongoing experiment. Mm. You change the parameters a little here, and what do you get? And so that's maybe a perpetual question. And that's why some projects keep kind of being driven <laughs> forward by that question. Seed assignment, you know, now like seven years into it, I could spend a lot of time making images with pretzels. Like pretzels are a really useful building material. But it's, it sort of feels too easy to just yeah. keep doing that. Yeah. So the question now is like, what else is there? What else is there? What haven't I tried yet? What, what is there more still to be done here? And that question kind of, in some ways, gets harder the longer the project goes on. I've sort of, I feel like certain materials now, I'm done with. I'm not making any more Flemish portraits in the bathroom. Like, that was done, and that's that. And now, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe the seriality is just a reflection of the the curiosity of, of trying to sort of see what the what else there might be there mm -hmm. and then to show the results of that. that makes sense. And I saw someone in the front row. Yes. So on your song of the island, which was really beautiful by the Thank way. Thank you. Um, what was the most interesting cassette tape that um, you ended up finding? Can you repeat? Yeah, so the question was about this piece called Songs of the Islands, where I was collecting discarded um, audio tape ribbons that I was finding on the streets of New York and, and bringing the stuff home, these like, you know, probably peed upon by dogs, you know, clumps of tape, and cleaning them up, and then discovering you can just kind of stick them through a cassette tape player, and it, they play, um, often with sort of an amazing damage -y kind of overlay of <laughs> distortion on them. Um, there is one recording that I find so odd, and it's, it's, it's a recording that sounds like it's been made ambiently in a room. It sounds like there's a TV on, and there's a bird in the room chirping, and the TV, I've ne I'd never been able to identify what the sound of the TV was, but someone once said to me, I think it's an episode of All in the Family, because you can hear Archie Bunker's voice, and Edith, I think, is the yeah, character's name yeah. with that crazy voice. And so I went back and listened to it and thought, I think, that, I think that's right. So why was someone recording an episode of All in the Family ambiently with their bird? And I don't know, where, why, why did they have that on a cassette tape? I, I'll never know, but that's one of my favorite bits. Great word. Yeah. All right, yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about image resolution because some of the some of the <coughs> pictures in the exhibit are really high quality. Yeah. And there's one of um, the sort of books that feels like I actually have <laughs> are there books in the room. Yeah. Uh, then there are others that are clearly including in the uh, recurrence ceremony, there are parts that are, you know, yes. not at all yes. quality. Yes. So sorted books began. I never, I never intended it to be such a photographically based project. You know, it was, that's another thing that I, I just did that thinking I was ever, only ever gonna do it once. Um, and the pictures that I took, 
for the first iteration of sorted books, um, we're just taken with my 35 millimeter slide you know, film camera and snap, 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 just to document. I didn't think I'd be printing from them. Um, and as the project went on, um, the presence of the books as prints later kind of started to become more and more important, so the quality of the pictures also started to get better. Um, and the person, who I, I, what I tend to do with that project now is I work with a photographer who has far better equipment and photographic training than me to take the pictures, and we sort of work together on it. The guy who took those pictures for Delaware, um, he was amazing, and many people, these, this is the series where the books are, are shown covers up, they're these um, books from the turn of the century, and they have very beautiful covers, and uh, many people think the books are in there. I've, I've been asked the question, when do you have to give the books back to the Delaware Art Museum, and, you know, <laughs> so it's strange how illusionistic yeah. those are. Um, seat assignment has been another project where the resolution thing is interesting because as camera phones get better and better, I'm able to print pictures bigger and bigger and sharper and sharper, and so you can see a sort of change and arc of what's possible um, with, with things in that project as well. I think we have time for one more. Um, you and then over there. I'm curious, it's really funny. And I was, I've only seen a little bit, because we just got here a little bit later, I'm looking for anything, I'm laughing almost every single thing I see. And I was wondering, you have a very unique experience that you often get in museums and in talks. And I wonder, maybe something about how often people don't take funny things seriously. Yeah. Like how they, Funny movies have made an Academy Award or anything like that. Mm. But then I start thinking, well, why is it funny? Mm. Why is the Morse code popcorn thing funny? Mm. And, um, and, does it, and then I was a little bit of guilt about walking through the museum and laughing at all the things that I'm And then I start thinking, is it supposed to be funny? Am I missing something that's funny? Or is it funny? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's like, why is your stuff funny? And why do we not have more <laughs> It's a great question. Um, funny can be quite complicated, I will say. And I, I've never set out to, ever to kind of make something that should be funny. Like, that's, that's not really the point. It's not the end goal. Um, at the same time, I'm aware of my attractions to the things in the world that are awkward, that don't quite add up, that are mistranslated, all these things we've been talking about. I think often lead to something that, you know, can be, can be funny. Um, Humor is also very useful as a hook. It brings people in. It tends to make them feel welcome. It tends to make them feel like they kind of know where they are in a way. Um, that's important to me too, that there's, it's, it allows a kind of access, you could say. Um, it is also complicated, and I think your comment is very insightful because there's still something about the art world, if we can say there is such a thing, because there are many art worlds, I really think, too. Um, but that like, there's an expectation, I think, a very old-fashioned kind of romantic expectation often that art should be this like very serious thing or the only way to talk about a serious thing is seriously and I think I really contest that I think that that um, sometimes under the most dire circumstances we can think about moments where something has been made couched in humor that talks about something absolutely dead serious very important the role right now in this country of comedy of critique via comedy, you know, everything from like The Onion to Colbert, I mean, yep. very, very important. Um, historical examples abound, but I think sometimes humor is a kind of Trojan horse that, that allows you to get away with it because you're just making a joke. And, and I don't want to, at this moment, really don't want to underestimate how, how useful that could be, perhaps. So um, there are a lot of reasons, I guess, why I've, I've, I wind up there. Um, I never mind people laughing. I love hearing people laugh in shows of work of, of mine. Um, but I also really insist that funny and frivolous are not the same thing. And, and that is sometimes, I, that has caused problems for me sometimes, I think, with, with the way that the work has been received. That, um, I will also add that I think there's a gendered component to this in an interesting way of, of like, I don't know. Can I say the part about how much I hate the words whimsical and Go quirky now? Yeah. I hate the words <laughs> Don't whimsical. use those. Don't ever say that to me. <laughs> I know people mean, they don't mean it to be offensive, but there's something about those two adjectives that I just cannot stand when I have to read them des describing what I do. And the reason for that is just because they sound so lacking in agency. It's like, oh, I made this thing, ha ha. And that is not what it feels like. It feels like decisions are being made, you know, along the way all the time. So. Um, yeah. I think we'll end there. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you. And thank you, thank all. you all for coming.